Hey guys, this is chapter 17 of Warhorse. It was only with the greatest difficulty that I stayed standing on my three good legs in the veterinary wagon that carried me that morning away from the heroic little Welshman who had brought me in. A milling crowd of soldiers surrounded me to cheer me on my way. But on the long rattling roads I was very soon shaken off my balance and fell in an ungainly, uncomfortable heap on the floor of the wagon. My injured leg throbbed terribly as the wagon rocked from side to side on its slow journey away from the battlefront. The wagon was drawn by two stocky black horses, both well groomed out and immaculate in well oiled harnesses. Weakened by long hours of pain and starvation, I had not the strength even to get to my feet when I felt the wheels below me running at last on smooth cobblestones and the wagon came to a jerking standstill in the warm, pale autumn sunshine. My arrival was greeted by a chorus of excited neighing as I raised my head to look. I could just see over the sideboards a wide cobbled courtyard with magnificent stables on either side and a great house with turrets beyond. Over every stable door were the heads of inquisitive horses, ears pricked. There were men in khaki walking everywhere and a few were running now towards me one of them carrying a rope halter. Unloading was painful, for I had little strength left and my legs had gone numb after the long journey. But they got me to my feet and walked me backward gently down the ramp. I found myself the centre of anxious and admiring attention in the middle of the courtyard, surrounded by a cluster of soldiers who inspected minutely every part of me, feeling me all over. What in thunder! Do you think you're about, you lot? Came a booming voice echoing across the courtyard. It's an horse. It's an horse, just like the others. A huge man was striding towards us, his boots crisp on the cobbles. His heavy red face was half hidden by the shade of his peaked cap that almost touched his nose and a ginger moustache that spread upwards from his lips to his ears. It may be a famous horse, it may be the only thundering horse in the old thundering war brought in alive from no man's land. But it is only an horse, and a dirty horse at that. I've had some rough-looking specimens brought in here in my time, but this is the scruffiest, dirtiest, muddiest horse I've ever seen. He's a thundering disgrace, and you're all stood about looking at him. He wore three broad stripes on his arm, and the creases in his immaculate khaki uniform were razor sharp. Now there's a hundred or more sick horses here in this hospital, and there's just twelve of us to look after him. This here young layabout was detailed to look after this one when he arrived, so the rest of you blighters can get back to your duties. Move it, you idle monkeys, move it! And the men scattered in all directions, leaving me with a young soldier who began to lead me away towards the stable. And you! came that booming voice again. Major Martin will be down from that house in ten minutes to examine that horse. Make sure that horse is so thundering clean and thundering shiny so you can use him like a shaving mirror, right? Yes, Sergeant, came the reply. A reply that sent a sudden shiver of recognition through me. Quite where I'd heard that voice before, I didn't know. I knew only that two words sent a tremor of joy and hope and expectation through my body and warmed me from the inside out. He led me slowly across the cobbles and I tried all the while to see his face better. But he kept just that much ahead of me so that all I could see was a neatly shaven neck and a pair of pink ears. How the devil did you get yourself stuck out there in no man's land, you old silly? He said. That's what everyone wants to know ever since that message came back that they'd be bringing you in here. And how the devil did you get yourself in such a state? I swear there's not an inch of you that isn't covered in mud or blood. Job to tell what you look like under all that mess. Still, we'll soon see. I'll tie you up here and get the worst of it off in the open air. Then I'll brush you up in the proper manner before the officer gets here. Come on, you silly. Once I've got you cleaned up, then the officer can see you and he'll tidy up that nasty cut of yours, and he'll give you food. I'm sorry to say, there's no water, not until he says so. That's what the sergeant told me. 
That's just in case they have to operate on you. And the way he whistled as he cleaned out the brushes was the whistle that went with the voice I knew. It confirmed my rising hopes and I knew then that I could not be mistaken. In my overwhelming delight, I reared up on my back legs and cried out to him to recognise me. I wanted to make him see who I was. Hey, careful there, you silly. Nearly had my hat off, he said gently, keeping a firm hold on the rope and smoothing my nose as he always had done whenever I was unhappy. No need for that. You'll be all right. Lot of fuss about nothing. Knew a young horse once just like you. Proper jumpy he was until I got to know him and he got to know me. You talking to them horses again, Albert? Came a voice from inside the next stable. Gosh, Struth, what makes you think they understand the perishing word you say? Some of them may not, David, said Albert. But one day, one day one of them will. He'll come in here and he'll recognise my voice. He's bound to come in here. And then you'll see a horse that understands every word that's said to him. You're not on about your Joey again. The head that came with the voice leant over the stable door. Won't you never give it up, Bertie? I've told you before. I've told you a thousand times. They say there's near half a million ruddy horses out here and you join the veterinary corps just on the off chance you might come across him. I pulled the ground with my bad leg in an effort to make Albert look at me more closely, but he just patted my neck and set to work cleaning me up. There's just one chance in half a million that your Joey walks in here. You've got to be more realistic. He could be dead. A lot of them are. He could have gone off to ruddy Palestine with the year, Manry. He could be where along hundreds of miles away in the trenches. If you weren't so ruddy good with horses, and if you weren't the best friend I had, I'd think you'd gone and gone a bit screwy the way you go on about your Joey. You'll understand why when you see him, David, Albert said, crouching down to scrape the caked mud off my underside. You'll see. There's no horse like him anywhere in the whole world. He's a bright red bay with a black mane and tail. He has a white cross on his forehead and four white socks that are all even to the last inch. He stands over 16 hands and he's perfect from head to tail. I can tell you, I can tell you that when you'll see him, you'll know him. I could pick him out of a crowd of a thousand horses. There's just something about him. Captain Nichols, you know. You know him. He's dead now. The one I told you about that brought Joey from my father. Him that sent me Joey's picture. He knew it. He saw it the first time he set eyes on him. I'll find him, David. That's what I came all this way for, and I'm going to find him. Either I'll find him, or he'll find me. I told you, I made him a promise, and I'm going to keep it. You're around the ruddy twist, Bertie, said his friend, opening a stable door and coming over to examine my leg. You're around the ruddy twist, that's all I can say. He picked up my hoof and lifted it gently. This one's got a white sock on his front legs anyway. That's as far as I can tell under all this blood and mud. I'll just sponge the wound away a bit, clean it up for you, whilst I'm here. You'll never get this one cleaned up in time or otherwise. And I finished mucking out my ruddy stables. Not a lot else to do, and it looks as if you could do with a hand. Old Sergeant Thunder won't mind, not if I've done all he can do. To... I've done everything he's told me to. The two men worked tirelessly on me, scraping and brushing and washing. I stood quite still, trying only to nuzzle Albert to make him turn and look at me. But he was busying at my tail and my hindquarters. Three, said his friend, washing off another of my hooves. That's three white socks. Turn it up, David, said Albert. I know what you think. I know everyone thinks I'll never find him. There's thousands of army horses with four white socks. I know that. But there's only one with a blaze in the shape of a cross on the forehead. And how many horses shine red like fire in the evening sun? I tell you, there's not another one like him, not in the whole wide world. Four, said David. That's four legs and four white socks. Only the cross on the forehead now, and a splash of red paint on this muddy mess of a horse, and you'll have your Joey standing right here. Don't tease me, said Albert quietly. Don't tease, David. You know how serious I am about Joey. It'll mean all the world to me to find him again. Only friend I ever had before I came out to the war. I told you that. I grew up with him, I did. Only creature on this earth I felt any kindship for. 
David was now standing by my head. He lifted my mane and brushed away at first, gently, but then more vigorously as my forehead, blowing the dust away from my eyes. He peered closely and then set again, brushing down towards the end of my nose and up again. He brushed between my ears as I tossed my head with impatience. Bertie, he said quietly, I'm not teasing, honest, I'm not. You said your Joey had four white socks, all even to the inch, right? Right, said Albert, still brushing my tail. And you said that Joey had a white cross on his forehead. Right, Albert said, still completely disinterested. Now I've never seen a horse like that, Bertie, said David, using his hand to smooth down the hair on my forehead. I wouldn't have thought it possible. Well, it is, I tell you said Albert sharply, and he was red, flaming red in the sunlight. I wouldn't have thought it possible, his friend went on, keeping his voice in check. Not until now, that is. Oh, pack it in, David, Albert said, and there was a genuine irritation in his voice now. I've told you, haven't I? I told you, I'm serious about Joey. So am I, Bertie. Dead serious. I'm not messing. I'm serious. This horse has four white socks, all evenly marked like you said, and this horse has a clear white cross on his head. This horse, as you can see for yourself, has a black mane and tail. The horse stands over 16 hands and when he's cleaned up he'll look pretty as a picture and this horse has a red bay under all that mud, just like you said Bertie. As David was speaking, Albert suddenly dropped my tail and moved slowly around me, running his hand along my back. Then at last we stood facing one another. There was a rougher hue to his face, I thought. He had more lines around his eyes, and he was a broader, bigger man in his uniform than I remembered him. But he was Albert, and there was no doubt about it, he was my Albert. Joey, he said tentatively, looking into my eyes. Joey? I tossed up my head and called out to him in my happiness, so that the sound echoed around the yard and brought houses and men to the door of their stables. It could be, said Albert quietly. You're right, David. It could be him. It sounds like him, even. But there's one way I know, for sure. He said this as he untied my rope and pulled the halter off my head. Then he turned and walked away to the gateway before facing me, cupping his hands to his lips and whistling. It was his owl whistle, the same low, stuttering whistle he had used to call me when we were walking out together back at home on the farm all those long years ago. Suddenly there was no longer any pain in my leg and I trotted easily over towards him and buried my nose in his shoulder. It's him, David, Albert said, patting his arms around my neck and hanging on to my mane. It's my Joey. I found him. He's come back to me just like I said he would. See? said David. What did I tell you? I'm not often wrong, am I? Not often, Albert said. Not often, and not this time. <laughs>